Well, let me thank all of you for coming out, and let me thank um, the uh, school system for organizing this event. And uh, let me not get you too nervous by telling you that you are not only the future of this country, but that your political activism and involvement may help save the entire planet due to the crisis of climate change. So, what I wanna just very briefly convey to you uh, is a different point of view than you see on TV uh, or you're gonna hear on the radio. And that is, I want you to think about a new America, America where we have an economy and a government that works for all of us and not just the 1%. And more importantly, and I want to throw this out to you, and I want you to think about it. What are you entitled to as a human being, as an American citizen? No, up, 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 up. I didn't mean an answer right now. But I want you to think about it. This is the important point. A hundred plus years ago, working class kids did not go to public schools. They worked in factories and they worked in fields all over America. And then people said, you know what, that's wrong. We want our kids to get a decent education. So you walk in the door of this school tomorrow, no one asks you how much money your family has, you are entitled to it. That's what we've done as a society. You vote, well you will vote, your parents vote. That didn't happen by accident. There were people in the founding of this country who said, it's a long history, it wasn't for everybody, but who said that we don't want to be run by a king or a few people, we want everybody to be able to participate in the political process. You have the right to vote. You want to protest out there. You want to protest Bernie Sanders? People do it all the time. Get a picket line. You have the right to protest. We have a Bill of Rights. We have a Constitution. But I want you to think about what we don't have in this country, where other countries actually do have. We have in America 87 million people who are uninsured or underinsured, who don't go to a doctor when they should. Do we have, now here is the question, should we have a right to health care as a human right, not as a privilege? I think so. Not everybody does. Many of you, I hope, are thinking of getting a higher education. Some of you will not be able to afford to go to college, or you're going to leave school deeply in debt. There are countries all over the world that say that they want all of their kids, regardless of their income, who have the ability to get a higher education. Should that be a right? Okay, it is in some countries. In some countries, if a mom has a baby, she'll get 10 months off with full pay. In the United States, women go back to work after a week or two if they don't have a whole lot of money. Should people be able to have paid family and medical leave as a human right? Okay. Tonight, in the United States, half a million people will sleep out on the streets or in emergency shelters. Should housing be considered a human right? Okay, so that's what I want you to be thinking about. What we are entitled to as human beings. And I think when you think about that, you'll also be understanding that you live in a society with mass inequalities. Now, you don't see this on television very often, and I want you to ask yourselves why you don't. Three people in America own more wealth than the bottom half of the country. What do you think about that? All right, three people. The top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 92%. Yesterday, here in Des Moines, I sat down with some workers in, um, who work for McDonald's, including a mother who has three kids. She makes 10 bucks an hour. She can't take care of her kids adequately on 10 bucks an hour. So you got a handful of people who have unbelievable wealth. You got millions of people struggling hard, including your parents, to put food on the table, make sure you have health care and decent education. And you got 40 million people living in poverty while three people own more wealth than the bottom half of America. You have to think about that. Is that appropriate? Is that right? How did it happen? How does it happen that in that context, President of the United States and the Republican leadership gave over a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top 1% and to large corporations 
while they want to cut back on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, education, and environmental protection. So these are some of the issues. I'm going to get to answer some questions now. But I want you to be thinking hard about the kind of America you want to see, what justice means, economic justice, social justice, racial justice, environmental justice. And your job, I know a lot of your friends probably are saying to you, why are you going to a political meeting on a Sunday? You must be nuts, right? You tell them that they are nuts, that you are doing exactly the right thing, you believe in democracy, you want to hear from candidates, and you want to make this country a better place. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that, Mike. Uh, and I would like to welcome you back here, actually. You were here in uh, April 2016 uh, during the last election, so welcome back to Roosevelt High School. Uh, we're going to start off with the same question that every candidate today has received and will receive. Uh, when registering to attend this event, uh, almost 57% of students reported that they'd be eligible to vote in the 2020 election, yet only 44% said that they planned to. If you win the Democratic nomination, what will you do to engage America's youth and increase voter participation? Well, we do that, certainly as president, I would do that big time. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the younger generation, it turns out, is the most progressive generation uh, in the history of our country. But unfortunately, as you've indicated, not only here in Iowa, but all over the country, young people do not participate in as great in numbers as they should. So what I say to the young people, if you want to live in a society we have decent paying jobs, you gotta participate. If you wanna live in a society where healthcare is a human right, you gotta participate. If you wanna join the fight against racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and religious bigotry, and I know many of you feel strongly about those issues, you gotta participate. If you are concerned that the planets that you are living in may not be healthy and habitable for your kids and your grandchildren and future generations, you better participate. So my plea is, not just for me, obviously I would like your support, but my plea is for you, that you gotta make democracy work, you have to stand up to very powerful special interests who contribute hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into the political process. So that would be my, um, that would be my view toward the young people. Uh, now, your first question from the audience is going to come from Cade Van Meteren. He's a student at Ankeny Centennial High School. How do you plan to address climate change, especially considering that it will most adversely impact current and future generations such as ours? All right, let me... Um, I, I would urge you all uh, to go to my website. It's berniesanders.com, where we have just laid out a few weeks ago the most comprehensive and bold climate change plan that any candidate for president, I think almost any candidate has ever uh, introduced. It is a very bold plan, it is a very expensive plan. And what the plan basically does is what the scientists tell us we have to do. And that is we need dramatic transformation of our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And what we do in the process is create some 20 million jobs moving this country into energy efficiency, retrofitting homes all over this country. The kind of gun violence that takes place. We're losing about 40,000 people a year, maybe half of that to suicide, as a matter of fact, the others to shootings. So what I think we need to do is what the American people want us to do, which is to implement kind of common sense gun safety legislation, which will have zero impact on your ability to hunt should hunt, you know. If you want to hunt, that's your right. But what it does do is creates, it expands background checks to make sure that folks who buy guns are not people who have been involved in violence or domestic violence in the past. Uh, it does away with the gun show loophole, which allows people to legally buy guns by avoiding a background check. It does away with the so-called straw man provision, which allows you to walk into a gun, gun store buy guns legally, and then sell them to criminal elements. And I happen to believe that we should ban the sale and distribution of assault weapons as well, which is something I doubt that you use for hunting, right? 
Okay, that's kind of what we have in mind. So don't let anybody, you know, here's the point. What, what I've just described is not just what I want to see, and there's more that has to be done. It's what the American people want, overwhelmingly in some cases. But it's not happening, and it's not happening because the Republican Party is intimidated by the NRA. And I don't think it should be the NRA that makes gun policy in America. I think it should be the American people. So I will not be intimidated by the NRA, but you will be able to continue to enjoy hunting. Okay? Uh, Senator, a quick follow-up. Uh, now, you've previously voted against holding gun manufacturers liable for injuries uh, caused by their products. Wouldn't liability encourage... No, it's not a question of holding them responsible for injuries. Nobody thinks you hold somebody responsible for injuries. What you hold people responsible for is if you are a gun manufacturer, mm -hmm. okay, and you're selling guns to a gun store in a town, and suddenly you're selling huge amounts of guns in yeah. a small town. Something is wrong there, and that gun... A gun manufacturer should be held liable for that. But okay. you voted in the past against holding right. them but liable. Right, but the world, is, I did, I did. But it's not a question, what we have seen in recent years is gun manufacturers not doing what they should do and address that issue of large numbers of guns going to areas which do not support, would not normally support uh, those numbers. So in the future, would you vote to Yes, I'm on the bill that would do that now. Okay. Okay, uh, your next question will come from Megan Simmons. Uh, she's the Director of Strategy at Student Voice, a national organization focused on empowering youth. Uh, she's a student at Barnard College and flew all the way here to ask you this question. No pressure. Um, how will you work to give young people a seat at the table in your administration, even if they aren't old enough to vote yet? Repeat that question again, I'm sorry. How will you work to give young people a seat at the table in your administration, even if they aren't old enough to vote yet? Okay, great, great question. Well, you know, it's a funny thing. I'll tell you what I did when I was, I was mayor of a city called Burlington, Vermont. Anybody ever visit Vermont here? Great, well, we want you all to come and visit us. <laughs> and Burlington, I don't know, how big is Des Moines? Anyone know? 250,000? Okay, so it's a lot bigger than Burlington. Burlington is the largest city in Vermont. We're only 40,000. I was mayor there for eight years. And literally before, I took office, I think it was a month interval between the election and taking office. We had meetings with parents and young people to talk about how the city could address their problems. I believe very much that if we're gonna be a vibrant democracy, you gotta listen to the young people. We gotta listen to know what's on your minds. You are citizens of America, and even if you can't vote, you are impacted by public policy. So I did that as mayor, and the end result, we had a whole lot of youth programs uh, that the kids wanted. We had, I'm, I'm detouring a little bit, but I'll just tell you one story. Uh, you know, we had a lot of kids who were, you know, didn't do so well in school, but they were interested in music and, and stuff. We started a teen center. And you know who ran the teen center? The young people themselves. Okay, we didn't allow drugs or tobacco, but basically they ran it. We had a student newspaper, a city newspaper run by the students. We had a television program run by the students. So I believe very strongly that if we're going to maintain a vibrant democracy, we have to involve young people, let them know that their voices count, get them to thinking about the issues that impact their lives. So thanks very much for that question. Your next, student, uh, your next question will come from Grant DeWay, a student at Valley High School in West Des Moines. With all due respect, you have laid out broad plans for massive reform and expansion for government initiatives in higher education and healthcare. What's it going to do for taxes for the average American? Good, very good question. I have. I have introduced very, very progressive and strong programs both in healthcare and in education. And your question is what does it mean for the average taxpayer, right? Okay. Right now, we spend twice as much per person on health care as do the people of any other country, okay? And yet we have 87 million people who have no health insurance or they are underinsured. So answer your question, a Medicare for all single payer system will end up costing the average American significantly less than he or she is paying today. Why is that? Because they're not gonna pay any more premiums. Now, you know, you know what a premium is. Okay, so depending on the policy that you have and where you work, 
you'd be paying $1,000 a month or $500 a month. Now that's called, I would call that an insurance company tax, okay? Let's just say you're paying 500 bucks a month, just in a premium to an insurance company, okay? I would call that an insurance company tax. It's gone, all right? We are going to do away with all deductibles, which means there's no more out-of-pocket expense when you and your family go to the doctor. We're doing away with all co-payments. Nobody in America on the Medicare for All, my plan, will pay more than $200 a year for prescription drugs. And anybody here who has a serious illness knows that families are spending sometimes thousands and thousands of dollars. You add all of that up, on one hand, the savings, and you say, okay, are you gonna pay more in taxes? Yeah, you are, depending on your income. If you're less than $28,000, you're not. But if you're more than that, you will pay something more in taxes. But the, what you pay in taxes will be, in most cases, depending on your income, significantly less than what you're paying in premiums, out-of-pocket expenses, uh, and co-payments. Now, you talked about uh, education, okay? We have a very broad education plan. This is our education plan. Our education plan makes public colleges and universities tuition-free, greatly expands Pell Grants and work-study programs, and cancels all student debt in America. That's a $2.2 trillion program, very expensive. We pay for that through a $2.4 trillion tax on Wall Street speculation. Okay, thanks for your question. Your next question will come from Drew Jaron. Uh, he's a student at Johnston High School. Drew. Hello. My father works as a sales representative for Pfizer, marketing drugs to doctors across Iowa. You've expressed opposition to Big Pharma and have proposed Medicare for All. I'm worried about my father's job under a Sanders presidency. How will you ensure that drug companies still have enough revenue to develop life-saving drugs? I think your father's job, job will probably be just fine. But I, let me say this. So I want to be very clear about saying this. A month ago, I took a trip from Detroit, Michigan, with some folks who have diabetes over to Windsor, Ontario. And anybody here dealing with diabetes? Anyone in the room? Thank God, good. Oh, we've got one person? I, I can't, yeah, we've got a diabetic over there. But you have about seven million people in this country who use insulin, okay? Do you know the difference in price in insulin for the same company was in Canada compared to the United States? It was one-tenth the price, 10% of the price. We pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. And you know why? It's not your dad's fault. I'm not blaming your dad. But you have a pharmaceutical industry which is not only incredibly greedy, they make huge profits every year, they have spent over the last 20 years billions of dollars on lobbying and campaign contributions to make sure that they can continue to charge the American people any price they want, highest in the world. Meanwhile, one out of five Americans cannot afford the medicine their doctors prescribe, and they're right now, in terms of the opioid epidemic, you're aware of that, the at least two companies, Purdue and Johnson & Johnson, will be paying billions of dollars in fines. You know why? Because they knowingly sold products to people that were addictive, swamped the market, and God knows how many thousands of people have died as a result. They're gonna pay billions of dollars in fines. Maybe some people will go to jail. Not to mention that there's massive price fixing in the industry. So tell your dad his job is fine, but tell your dad I am gonna take on the greed and the corruption and the price fixing in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, next up, you'll be hearing from Sheena Tran. She's a student at Hoover High School. As a young woman, I am worried about sexual violence and human trafficking in Iowa, especially because I am so young. Nearly every day, I'm confronted by a man who harasses me. So what can you do to stop American citizens from being sexually harassed and trafficked? Well, in terms of trafficking, uh, we will do everything humanly possible to put an end to it. It is a terrible, terrible crime, and we will crack down on traffickers and give support to those women who have been abused to get their lives back together again. In terms of sexual harassment, I mean, we have got to, and I say this to the young men here, we have got to create a culture and a climate 
uh, which understands that women have got to be treated uh, with respect and dignity. That's all. And um, women have got to, women will stand up for their rights, but this is a responsibility that, you know, rests with, with men. And you guys got to do the right thing. And as, uh, as a, a president, um, my views on these issues, on the issues of harassment and on women's rights and on gay rights and on civil rights uh, will be very, very different from the current president. That I promise you. Next, you'll be hearing from Will Bredensteiner. He's a student at Drake University. Thank you, Senator. Uh, politics has become so divisive that it's often difficult to see members of the opposing party as human. If you could say one genuine thing you admire about President Donald Trump, what would it be? I didn't hear that. I heard. Please do it again. Sure. Um, <laughs> politics has become so divisive that it's often difficult to see members of the opposing party as human. If you could say one genuine thing you admire about President Donald Trump, what would it be? <laughs> his hair. I'm really impressed by the color of his hair. <laughs> Look, I, 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 let me answer your question in a, in a, in a non-facetious way. You're, you're quite right. There is an incredible amount of divisiveness in this country. And if I say something, you'll say, well, you see, that's part of the divisiveness. But I just would ask you to kind of um, look not only at what's going on right now, but look at recent history. And, and I think the answer is, you may not be happy with this answer, but I think if you look at it, you'll find that there was once, I don't know, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, where you had a Republican party, which is what we would call a, a center-right party, conservative party, center-right. Uh, you had a president called Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was president in this country, who was probably a, what he would, his politics today would be a moderate Democrat, actually. <clears throat> but for a variety of reasons over the years, before Trump, the party moved very, very far to the right. And that is where it is right now. And it gives me no pleasure. I mean, it, it really does not. I have Republican colleagues who I respect, I like. They differ with me. You know, we, you know you'll be shocked to know people sit down, they have lunch together. They don't hate each other. But I have to say that in this president, you have somebody who is a racist, in my view, who is a sexist, who is a homophobe, who is a xenophobe, and who's a religious bigot. And you have to speak that out. And I have to do everything I can to take that type of behavior on. That's what I got to do. But But is there, is there a single thing about the president that you can say you admire? A single thing. Yeah, he gets up at 3 o'clock in the morning to tweet. So I'm impressed by people who get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, now, I'd like to move to a more personal question. Uh, in either your professional or personal life, who has been your hero and why? In my political life, I would say uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has been somebody who has inspired me. Uh, and uh, I urge all of you to read some of the very good biographies that are out there about King. And what you will learn is he was much more than what you will see uh, when his birthday comes on TV. And they'll talk about uh, the uh, speeches, the I have a dream speech, and so forth and so on. But he was a brilliant man, a brilliant organizer, uh, who had a vision when he died. Anybody here know what he was doing when he died? What, what project he was working on? He was working on a poor people, what he called the Poor People's Campaign, where he was bringing uh, blacks and whites and Latinos and Native Americans, uh, poor people from all over the country, all walks of life, together to march on Washington to demand a change in national priorities. Just a remarkable um, effort. And when he died, actually, when he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, he was not there on a quote-unquote civil rights issue. He was there to protect striking workers uh, who were sanitation workers, garbage collectors, who were being exploited and some had died on the job. 
and he stood up for workers his whole life. So he was a man of brilliance, uh, incredible courage, uh, and that is somebody who has influenced uh, my life a whole lot. Please feel free to have a couple of minutes of closing remarks. I think we've discussed a, a lot. And let me just, let me just conclude by reiterating um, this thought. There is, you live in a nation of which a, a lot is happening that we should be very proud of. A lot of great history in America. And, uh, but you're living in a nation in which a lot of stuff is going on that we should not be proud of. Uh, and what I want you to, to be thinking about is, and the question did not come up, because it's, it's very rarely asked. It's not something that people think about a whole lot. Where does the power lie in America? Now, obviously, if somebody's elected president, they got a lot of power, that's for sure. Whether it's Trump or Bernie Sanders or anybody else, that's a lot of power. But real power also rests in other hands. We have a political system today that says that if you are a billionaire, you can contribute hundreds of millions of dollars to elect candidates who represent your interests. Does that sound like democracy to you? We have Republican governors all across this country who are working overtime to make it harder for people of color or poor people or young people. In New Hampshire, almost all white state, they're making it very difficult for young people to vote because they're afraid of how young people will vote. Does voter suppression sound like democracy to you? All right. We live in a country where you have, whether it is insurance industry or the pharmaceutical industry or Wall Street or the fossil fuel industry or the prison industrial complex or the military industrial complex, you have entities out there that are unbelievably powerful. They make huge amounts of campaign contributions. They influence what goes on in Washington and in state legislatures all over America. And what my campaign is about and why we call it us, not me, is that I believe that no president, not Bernie Sanders or anybody else, can do it alone. We need millions of people. So I was asked earlier, should we involve young people in the political process? Absolutely, we desperately need you. All right, so I'm here to say to you, I don't think, obviously I would like your support. If you choose to support another candidate, that's fine too. But what I am saying to you is not only that you must get involved in the political process, think through all of these issues and the hundred other issues that we have not talked about. Think about the America that you want. Think about why we are not there. Think about what you got to do to bring us there. And by the way, talk to your friends and tell them that you don't want to hear them complain about the cost of college. You don't want to hear them complain about anything. You want them involved in the political process. And as one of the questioners asked me, and it's a good point, treat people with respect. He's right, we have too much uh, anger and, and vitriol in, in, in the political process now. Disagree, if, you have a, if you're a progressive and you have a conservative friend, talk it out. See where you agree, see where you disagree. But it is absolutely imperative, especially in the era of Trump, who is an authoritarian type personality, who gravitates to authoritarian leaders all over this country, who does not really, in my view, believe in the Constitution of the United States or the separation of powers. Especially at this time, let's all agree that we've got to fight to protect democracy. And I would hope very much that all of you will get seriously involved in the political process. Thank you all very much. <laughs>